Welcome everyone to our Green Bank Community Zoom. I'm just gonna give a few moments for people to go ahead and join. I see attendees coming in. Okay, it looks like the attendee list has stabilized. So why don't we go ahead and get started? My name is Ryan Lynch. I'm a staff scientist here in Green Bank. Uh, very frequently, if you if you signed into these community Zooms before, you either have seen Jim Jackson or Dave Freyer typically doing the introduction here. Both of them are unavailable. So it gives me great pleasure to host our speaker today. Before I introduce him, uh, just a little bit of observatory news. So as many of you probably know, we just recently had our deadline for our 2024B proposal call in conjunction with NRIO. Uh, the deadline was January 31st and um, a little bit different in that it wasn't uh, the first of the month, but just the Wednesday closest to the 1st of February. Anyway, it was a really good uh, proposal call. We had 99 GBT proposals um, that includes uh, proposals requesting only Green Bank as well as proposals requesting uh, the GBT as part of VLBI or GMVA, which is a record uh, basically since uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, so it's really great to see the proposal numbers back up. It's not here on this slide, but um, it was about a total of 11,000 hours total of GBT time requested, um, including nine large projects. So great to see all of that. Um, we also just recently completed an observer training workshop last week to train people to remotely use the GBT. And I just wanted to remind everyone that our single dish summer school, which is designed to introduce uh, people about the graduate student level and above to single dish radio astronomy. Um, applications um, will be due by March 1st, and the school itself will be held this June, June 23rd through 29th, in person at the observatory. So if you or any of your students or anyone else that you know is interested in attending that, um, please visit our website. You can find links, the link here, as well as um, links from our main website, um, and go ahead and get your applications in. And with that, I am now going to introduce our speaker, uh, Paulo Freire. Paulo is a scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy, frequent GBT user and collaborator. And he is going to be telling us about uh, NGC 1851E, a millisecond pulsar in a binary system with a compact companion in the mass gap between neutron stars and black holes. So I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Paulo. Um, just as a reminder, you can use the Q&A feature in the webinar to ask questions, and we will address those at the end of the talk. All right, take it away, Paula. All right, uh, I'm going to now share my uh, screen here. Um, can everyone see uh, my talk live? Yes, we can. Uh, OK, um, good. Uh, so uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy Valentine's to everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about these these results uh, that uh, Ryan just uh, uh, mentioned. So by the way, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this here. Um, so this is a, a result of a lot of uh, work by a lot of people in our group. Uh, so just uh, very briefly, um, so what I'm going to talk a little bit is uh, pulsars and types of pulsars. I guess many of you are familiar with pulsars, but uh, just to uh, you know to, to give some context to this. And then um, from that, um, I pass to the uh, reasoning or the motivation for why we search for pulsars and globular clusters. And then after that, um, uh, I'm going to then focus a bit more and mention uh, Meerkat and Trapum. And then uh, from that, uh, focusing a bit more and go to NGC 1851 in particular to this globular cluster, which turns out to be a real uh, box of surprises. And then uh, focusing even more then on the pulsar uh, that the, the result is about NGC 1851E and, and then discussing a little bit of the nature of the system and the uh, nature of the companion. So uh, pulsars and types of pulsars, you know, um, they are cosmic lighthouses. I uh, don't need to tell, tell this to this crowd. 
And the idea is that, of course, by keeping track of the radio pulses, we also keep track of the rotation of the uh, binary system. The, the nice thing about it is that uh, when you find a pulsar in a binary system, and the first one was found in 1974, so uh, almost 50 years ago at the Arecibo Observatory, um, uh, when you find a, a pulsar, you can uh, make measurements of its um, velocity, radial velocity, and uh, uh, track the um, track the orbital motion uh, very precisely. Uh, however, uh, the method that was employed here in this particular plot, so this is a, a plot of 1913 plus 16, um, the orbital period is about seven hours, 45 minutes, uh, orbital eccentricity is 0.617. Uh, this method of tracking the velocities um, as a function of, um, uh, of time is actually um, doesn't uh, make use of the full power of uh, radio pulsars. Um, uh, if uh, it, because you have in a in a binary pulsar you have um, uh, basically a clock in the system, we can actually measure the the range. So the the, uh, the so the integral of the velocity along the line of sight. So we have a line of sight velocity. You can integrate that and measure that coherently, and the. Uh, the result for this is that the five Keplerian orbital parameters that we can measure from pulsar timing uh, become thousands of times more precise if we can establish a coherent solution. And this is basically for free. Uh, and this is a really important feature from uh, for, for binary pulsars. And it's unique to them. That's why we can use them for you know, studying gravitational waves, uh, studying these, these uh, gravi uh, orbital effects in these binaries. Um, so this feature is unique uh, to pulsars, and um, it allows us, this precision allows us to measure the relativistic effects, uh, which are cost, uh, qualify, quantified by the post-Keplerian parameters. So you see on here on the left, we have a picture with the orbital motion of the pulsar. If you subtract um, the, 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 the Keplerian orbit for this particular pulsar, then you, I have to zoom in by a factor of a million because then you see the, the, the scale goes from seconds to microseconds in order to be able to see the residuals. And in the residuals, you see this tiny um, a peak uh, near the, the, the right of the picture. This is an example of a relativistic effect um, on the in this case on the propagation of the light signal or the radio signal. And, uh, and this is a relativistic effect that we then can subtract and then you get the residuals at the bottom. So the, this is a really fundamental thing about pulsar timing is that we can measure these, these effects um, um, very precisely. In the case of the uh, uh, 1913 plus 16, so this is the Hall-Steller pulsar, uh, we can transform each of these effect, relativistic effects that we see in the timing, like the precession of periaster, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that, the orbital decay, the, or, the Einstein delay, which is the, the consequence of gravitational redshift, I can use the theory of gravity in this case, general relativity, to 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 uh, uh, see what kinds of masses are consistent with each of these effects. And there's a unique combination of masses that you see there that uh, actually gives us, um, uh, you know, we have a single combination that can explain all the effects. So because these lines are um, uh, traced according using GR. Um, we can be pretty sure that, um, you know, the, well, we can test the theory here. And the fact that the three of them pass in the same point is, is uh, allows us to, is it basically means that the general relativity passes this test. Um, in this publication from uh, Weisberg et al. 2016, they not, not only measure these three classical effects in the system, but they also measured the Shapiro delay. And we can use these um, Shapiro delay parameters to measure two additional effects. And they are both consistent with the masses that we already had before. So um, one of, of course, one of the things about the orbital decay here is that uh, you can uh, calculate what's the expectation from gravitational waves. And that's the, the, the solid line here. And you then you make measurements for the uh, cumulative uh, periastron time, passage of periastron time. And because of this linear change in the orbital period, the system is coming in earlier and earlier. So it means gravitational wave exists. And this was, of course, a Nobel Prize here for the, for the discovery of this system. And this was, of course, very important for the construction of gravitation wave detectors, not only because they pro provided the source, but, um, but uh, because the, um, the system really um, uh, provided also um, a confirmation that gravitation waves are real and they really carry energy uh, through the universe. 
So um, the types of pulsars that we uh, we look. So if you look at the mass mass diagram, I mean you cannot have a pulsar um, a pulsar talk without a mass that mass diagram. You see um, that there is a main clump in the center, which are the young pulsars. Uh, they have uh, some of them are, that are circled in green are associated with supernova remnants. Um, and then on the lower uh, end, uh, with those squares are the um, Millet and recycled pulsars. Um, and many of those uh, those squares mean that they are associated with the binary. So that tells you a clue about how they form. And uh, they form in a, in a, um, um, binary systems that somehow survive the, the first supernova. So you can see in the, the, in the diagram on top, there's a primary, secondary, the primary explodes and the system either dissociates or then you have the, uh, or, or survives. And then what happens next depends on the mass of this companion. So if the if the companion is very massive, then again, you have a supernova, and then the system either again dissociates again or forms an eccentric double neutron star system. So eccentric orbits, massive companions there. Or if the companion um, slowly evolves to a white dwarf, then nothing special happens. So the orbital eccentricity, which is stage is zero, stays uh, very, very close to zero. And then you have these circular orbits. Um, and uh, and basically here, it's very difficult, more difficult to measure post capillary parameters, but it's possible. The important thing for this talk, um, so the Hustler pulsar is kind of with the eccentric system on the right. And we have now a lot of the PTA, nanograv, uh, EPTA pulsars that are these circular binaries uh, on, on, the, on the left. The important thing is that um, the eccentric orbits are from this part of the PP dot diagram. So the shortest of these systems, uh, so the pulsar in this system that spins fastest has a spin period of about 17 milliseconds or slower. So many of them had uh, periods above 100, uh, almost 200 milliseconds. The reason is because of the fast evolution of this of these, um, uh, massive companion, which does not give you much time for the spin up of the pulsar. It is when we have a low mass uh, companion that you have then plenty of time for the spin up of the pulsar. So, uh, and this is what we observe in the galaxy. So this is a basically an, an iron pattern that we see. All the, all the systems in the very low, low um, uh, left corner uh, are uh, the ones that are in binaries are circular binaries. And the ones that have uh, and with the low mass uh, white dwarf components and the ones that have higher mass white dwarf components or eccentric, uh, high, you know, those double neutron star systems are further up in, in the PP dot diagram. So this is a really important uh, distinction and uh, we're going to find systems in global clusters that do not uh, obey these, this particular um, uh, system, this particular uh, uh, law. Um, so, now I'm going to move to this, to the motivation. Why do we look for pulsars in globular clusters? And uh, the thing is, of course, the, the main thing about globular clusters that's interesting is that they have these very uh, high stellar densities, uh, which means that uh, we can form uh, objects that are more binary that are impossible in the galactic disk, uh, and in particular via um, H exchange interactions. And so one thing to keep in mind is that the stellar population in globular clusters is extremely old. So at the beginning of the life of the globular cluster, we could have massive stars, but of course then uh, they've all become, um, you know, from the evolution, they have only become uh, either uh, white dwarfs, uh, neutron stars, or black holes. Additionally, with time, they will tend to concentrate in the center. All these, these um, uh, particularly the more massive uh, neutron stars and black holes will concentrate in the center by a dynamical friction. And uh, uh, once they get there, um, then uh, something will happen to them, which is that, uh, for instance, you can have a, a system of uh, two uh, main sequence stars coming from the right and the in green from the, coming from the left, you will have a, a, a neutron star they exchange in some kind of chaotic encounter, and then the neutron star requires an, um, uh, a new companion, a main sequence star companion. So even if the supernovae that formed these neutron stars at the start of the life of the cluster, even if those did not survive, um, chances are that the, these, these neutron stars that are alone, that in our galaxy would be, disappear forever, 
uh, here in Govia clusters, they acquire new companions. So um, this means that in Govia clusters, we have a lot of uh, many uh, X-ray binaries. Uh, so the, as the companion evolves and the dumps mass on the pulsar, um, we have then a low mass X-ray binary. And there are many of these in Gobi clusters, not in absolute numbers, but uh, per unit mass, uh, there's more a thousand times more objects, uh, or at least three orders of magnitude more objects. And this has been known since the 1970s, more times, more types of these objects in Gobi clusters compared to the galaxy. And the, the thing, of course, is that this is the formations, uh, formation of the millisecond pulsar. So the, the idea is that um, is there are many of these sources, and if they form um, if they form uh, um, radio pulsars, uh, then um, then uh, we should well, look for them. So the first one was found in 1987 in the Gobi cluster M28, and many of them have been found in subsequent decades. So how many is what I'm going to talk about next. So one of the motivations for finding more pulsars in Gobi clusters is that uh, is the sheer productivity. Uh, these searches have been uh, very um, uh, productive, but they are still completely limited by sensitivity. And this is because pulsars are very faint radio objects. So um, detecting them in Gobi clusters, several kiloparsecs away is challenging. For a millisecond pulsar, a few kiloparsecs starts becoming difficult. And the repeating these surveys with high sensitivity, then we find more pulsars and that has been the trend. So uh, if we look at the world uh, until the uh, until the, the re recent years, so until mid of the until around 2015, these were the telescopes that were available for searching for pulsars. Arecibo unfortunately collapsed with a very sad event, but uh, these were these were the telescopes that we had, or that these are the telescopes that with which we could find um, um, pulsars, and it's a very small set. Uh, because it's only the largest radio telescope that centimeter wavelengths that we can do this. So this means that until 2018, um, the number of discoveries uh, was basically flat most of the time. Uh, there was that episode there where we had the Arecibo upgrade in the late 90s and the construction of the GBT. And the, of course, also the Parkes multibeam. This led to this increase in the early 2000s, especially the GBT. The GBT surveys uh, have been uh, extremely successful with uh, uh, more than uh, between close to 90 uh, pulsars found in Gobi clusters over the, over the years. But then you see that um, uh, for, for more than a decade after 2008, uh, for about that decade, the number starts rising slowly again. And the reason is because Gobi clusters are very small targets. So, uh, and you can cover one globular cluster reasonably with a single telescope beam. So uh, at some point you run out of targets and there's not, there's not many more discoveries. The few discoveries that have happened uh, recently until recently have been because of reprocessing of archival data. So that was the situation. So basically this means that we've reached a sensitivity limit and uh, well, our surveys are completely sensitivity uh, limited. So, um, so the nice thing that has been happening in recent years is that major telescopes uh, are coming online, uh, and the, the two main ones that have uh, um, are really making an impact are FAST and Meerkat. The GMRT is also producing more discoveries now uh, because it has also been upgraded, but. Um, to the moment, not as um, not quite the same numbers as fast as Meerkat. Uh, also, again, because of sensitivity issues. So, since the start of uh, the fast globular cluster survey and the Meerkat globular cluster survey, and uh, um, uh, and so on, and so there's an early Meerkat census and now a Meerkat uh, survey begin. We've had the an increase in the number of uh, millisecond or uh, number of pulsars in globular clusters by a factor of uh, more than two, and actually it's it's happening uh, quite fast because even this morning uh, I added the four more um, pulsars to the total is now three hundred fourteen. Uh, so in GLIMPS C zero one, so that's a, a globular cluster that had um, uh, you know one pulsar until recently. Recently found with the with the GBT at high, high dispersion measure. So GBT is still producing uh, fantastic results. 
in this area and then uh, fast discovered another pulsar and now with Meerkat we find another four. So that is so this is one of the reasons of course is that many of these millisecond many of these pulsars I mean it's a very strange pulsar population because it, it's in an old environment so we have a lot of, have a lot of millisecond pulsars and about half of them which are here in dark um, blue I mean dark green are in binary systems so we had a lot of really interesting objects to to study but the this is not the main reason why we look for for pulsars in globular clusters the reason is that these pulsars in globular clusters can be very odd and uh, an example is this system this was uh, found by myself using the gmrt in the 2004 so about uh, already 20 years ago that this was published and the the um, these uh, pulsars, um, this particular pulsar has a massive companion in an eccentric orbit, which in the galaxy, of course, would be variably a slow pulsar with periods, spin periods of tens of milliseconds. But here, as you can see on the y-axis, the spin period is about five milliseconds. So this is really um, a system unlike anything we see in the galaxy. And the reason for that is the, because in global clusters, we have these uh, exchange encounters. And uh, so, uh, and this actually, this cluster is so dense that you can have repeat encounters for the same object. So you have an encounter where you have the pulsar acquiring the main sequence companion, spinning it up. And then you have a second encounter where this donor, this mass donor that re uh, helped recycle pulsar is kicked away. And now it has a, a more massive, uh, more eccentric, uh, more massive companion, a degenerate companion in this case in an eccentric orbit. So um, uh, so this is secondary exchange encounters. This, uh, this is one of the biggest motivations for looking for pulsars in globular clusters. One of the things about this is that um, uh, these eccentric systems, so with massive, large companion masses, eccentric orbits, of course, allow us to measure several uh, post kepler parameters, as in the uh, Hulse-Taylor pulsar that I told you about. And also, um, the, they are exciting because the incoming object could be a black hole. And then you'd have a millisecond pulsar black hole, which is the kind of system that you cannot see in our in our Milky Way. So there has been a really great motivation for for searching for these kinds of systems uh, because then we can really study black holes in great detail. So now moving, trying to move a bit more, more faster, uh, Meerkat um, is uh, you know is giving us a lot of these a lot of these systems. So it's an array of sixty four twelve meter dishes located in the Karoo Desert in South Africa. This is my visit, my first visit to Meerkat in 2018. Um, I, I am in that picture. Um, and so uh, the sensitivity near the center, the sensitivity of this telescope represents uh, um, an order of four increase relative to parks. And with this with parks by, by this, I mean with already the ultra wide receiver. So it's really an improvement of an order of magnitude compared to the previous parks with the previous uh, detectors. And uh, and it has uh, this location in the southern hemisphere is spectacular because almost all globular clusters are in the southern hemisphere, um, and all the target almost all the targets of interest. So they, they cannot be searched with a uh, fast, for instance. So um, and uh, and so this is a really a, a fantastic uh, location, and it's a fantastic radio environment. Uh, sometimes you have trouble believing how how hard the uh, how clean this this this. Um, this environment is. Um, in order to use um, Meerkat uh, to do surveys, there have been several large science projects that were constituted. One of them is TRAPUM. Uh, TRAPUM does all kinds of pulsar searches. Uh, so the PIs are uh, Michelle Kramer and Ben Stoppers. Um, the, it does uh, all kinds of surveys, including surveys in body clusters, but also galactic plane survey and Fermi survey and so on. Uh, it has been very successful with more than uh, 200, close to 250 new pulsars discovered to date, but it's just beginning. And there is a second uh, um, LSP dedicated to timing radio pulsars, uh, with again with several lanes. Uh, this is called mere time. And uh, uh, yeah, one of the largest surveys, and this is one of the that is done with a, a collaboration between the Mirtan LSP and the, the Trapun, is the uh, Southern Globular Cluster. The reason for this is that some of the pulsars that are being timed in these Globular Clusters uh, are good targets for for timing already, 
And, but of course, then as we look at the global cluster, we also take search data. So uh, yeah, and the, these, um, these um, the global cluster discoveries, uh, now we're close to a hundred uh, new discoveries. And uh, so they are almost half of the discover of the this total discoveries with Trapham. So one of the um, um, first, um, when we start first looking at uh, global clusters, um, we did a small um, census and here's the, the, the result from this census. So uh, led, this was led by Alessandro Ridolfi, a former student of mine at Max Planck and Tasha Gautam at the time, my student as well. And then, so myself um, and uh, with great help from Scott Ransom with a lot of uh, search uh, expertise and uh, we and others, many people putting a lot of work here, uh, also from the South African side, and uh, they found these eight new pulsars. So this is Alessandro, this is Tasha at the time. And uh, this, um, this search uh, found, um, found uh, eight, and the, this search or used only the central core of the uh, of Meerkat because it didn't have the beam forming fully, fully working at the time. So use only the, the central core with 40 antennas. And we could find these eight pulsars. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, we targeted a lot of these very dense, the densest types of globular clusters, which are core collapse clusters, but others as well. And uh, yeah, we found, uh, for instance, um, an eccentric, uh, uh, massive uh, binary system in uh, a core collapse cluster called NGC6624. Uh, so that's 6624G. So th this is um, the pulsar in this system might be quite massive. We don't know the individual masses yet. We hope we, hope we will know them over the years. Uh, one of the global clusters where we've had more success is NGC 8051. Um, so this, this is a huge uh, but very distant global cluster located in Colombo. Um, the central density here is thought to be about 3 million solar masses per cubic parsec. So it's it's really a remarkable environment. And uh, uh, so there's a very large rate of stellar interactions, but also repeat interactions for each system. And the, the previous known pulsar in this system, NGC 1851A, for which I already showed the picture, is an example of that, a system, a pulsar that went through multiple uh, in interactions. This is the first paper that came out, uh, again, led by Alessandro Ridolfi, um, and, but uh, also co collaboration from the, some of the previous authors that you've seen already. Um, so um, tra with TRAPUM, we discovered 14 new pulsars in NGC in K51. So uh, there has been a discovery, uh, an additional discovery since the time of this paper. And um, yeah, and uh, here we are already using the, the main survey. So in the main survey, we have the beam former, and uh, uh, this is the problem, of course, of, uh, of using an array. And with the GBT, for instance, we can cover this whole region of interest with a single beam. Uh, when you have a beam former, you, of course, you need to create many beams to cover the region of interest, which is this, this circle, that circle that you see here, um, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, so you need to, to make many more beams. So on the, on the lot right, we are looking at UHF. So um, lower frequency, the beams are a bit larger. Um, on the left, on on the left is uh, L band, so beams are a bit smaller, so you need to make more of them. So of course, this means that we need to store much more data and process a lot more data. But uh, this is the uh, this is the price, of course, we pay for having such uh, a sensitive telescope. Uh, it will be very hard to make a single dish uh, as sensitive as this, and it will, of course, not be so good for for people that like to image things. So. There's some, um, these are the post profiles of some of the new discoveries. You can see they're not very well defined for some of them. So that means that most of these objects are extremely faint. Um, you can see the, the fluxes here. Uh, so this is a table with the, the numbers. So I'm not going through detail, but there's many things here with the fluxes of about 30 microjanskis. So the, the, there are really uh, truly miserable sources in terms of flux. Um, interestingly, all these new pulsars were found in the central beam. Of the so, we, although we take the data for a lot of beams, uh, only in the center did we find pulsars. It means that they are very, very concentrated towards the cluster core. Uh, this and also all quite fast. Um, and uh, uh, so, there's only one which is NGC 1851i that has a spin period of 32 uh, milliseconds. 
that most of the others are, uh, you know, quite reasonably fast. And, uh, there's four of them with a spin period of 5.5 milliseconds. So the, 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 they're really, um, they really like that period of 5.5 milliseconds. It's unbelievable. And uh, yeah, and the, which me, and six of them are isolated. It means that the others are in binary systems. Now, of this table, I'm going to focus on this particular system. So we have this uh, NGC 1851B and E. And if you look at the eccentricity and the minimum companion masses, that so the the columns, you see that they are highly eccentric, like NGC 1851A. They they are highly eccentric. And they have large companion masses. Um, so this is uh, these are the some of the first uh, spin period measurements. The the peak in NGC 1851D is not very well sampled in this, but we already know it was that, and it is confirmed with later measurements. The eccentricity really is 0 0.86, and uh, and you see the 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 NGC 1851E. You really see the the also the it's clearly an eccentric orbit. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is uh, these two systems are are uh, very interesting in the sense that particularly the second one NGC eighteen fifty one E because uh, we already knew that uh, if we had a pulsar with a mass of one point four solar masses, the companion has at least a mass of at least one point fifty three solar masses. So yeah, so this this was all known in two thousand twenty two. And I'm now going to the uh, cover the new paper NGC 1851E. Um, so uh, this paper is led by Ewan Barr. Uh, he has done a tremendous amount of work for for our um, for the Meerkat, the World Meerkat Observing System and Data Analysis and the surveys. So he's uh, he's, he's really put enormous amount of work in this. And my current uh, student uh, Aruni Maduta, she has also done a tremendous amount of work for this paper. Um, and many of the analyses that uh, are that you see hidden in the SOM are done a, a lot by her. So this is the the paper that you might have seen recently, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, so I'm going to go through the contents of the paper. So just um, uh, basically about NGC 1851E, you can see some of the best parameters. So with the Earth, we're kind of looking at the system from uh, below. From the so minus infinity at, at in the y axis, and uh, here we're assuming a mass ratio of uh, uh, one to two in favor of the companion, and uh, the uh, yeah the orbital uh, period is seven point four days, so it's not a very compact system. It's it's not, and um, yeah. So what we've did with with this system is that we uh, did the usual timing technique. So we establish a timing model. You keep taking data. You keep perfecting this model. At some point, you get we got a unique uh, solution, and uh, this unique solution is here. It's published. So um, uh, this was a bit of a um, took a, a, some work because we don't Meerkat doesn't give us much time. So uh, to get timing solutions, sometimes it's a bit challenging. But with the help from the whole team, we were able to do this. And from this timing solution, well, from all these numbers, of course, uh, it's typical in pulsar timing, we have a lot of precision here. I like to focus on uh, two sets of numbers. So one of them is the position of the pulsar, right ascension, and the other one, the precession of periostrum. So these are the most important numbers in this paper. Uh, and uh, the reason is the following. So because we know the position very well, we can pinpoint the position of the pulsar in the globular cluster, and uh, we know that the at this position there's no no star next to it. Uh, if the companion, uh, like uh, even if you assume the neutron star is once uh, is one point two solar masses, I mean the lowest ever seen, uh, the companion need to be at least one point four solar masses. So if it were a main sequence star, it would be the brightest star in this frame. And you see that 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 location of the pulsar. Uh, there's there's really um, uh, there's really nothing. Uh, so we can conclude without many doubts here uh, that the uh, companion is a compact object. Uh, there's no uh, there's not much doubt to that about to that. This means that the advanced periostron that we see in this system is very robust. So um, the uh, 
using the timing data, you can measure a rate of advanced like 0 0.03476 plus or minus 0 0.000031 degrees per year. And this measurement is remarkably robust uh, and we can try including different sets of data and so on. And it's, it's, it, it stays the same. This animation shows the or orbital orientation of the system for the next um, 10, 11,000 years. So it's traced every 100 years. Because, uh, so every 100 years, it moves for three, degree, three degrees, 3.4 degrees. And uh, yeah, so this, and this measurement is, is, is robust. So what does this measurement tells us? Um, well, if, we, if you have two, two neutrons, two compact objects, it basically tells us uh, what is the mass of the total mass of the system. Um, because uh, we already know the orbital frequency in this equation, which is this nb. It's I told you it's an orbital period you can measure. You can measure the eccentricity. Uh, that t sun is the solar mass parameter in time units. So the only thing that's not known there is the total mass. So if you measure omega dot, you measure the total mass, which is uh, 3.887 plus or minus 0 0.0045 solar masses. Just to have an idea uh, of what this represents. Uh, there is this plot from uh, uh, one of the gravitational wave papers. And there we have in green the, the, the ma total masses of the uh, double neutron star systems known in our galaxy. And then superposed on that, and that's what this, this particular LIGO-Virgo paper was about, was the detection of uh, uh, gravitational wave merger GW 190425. That's actually Freedom Day in Portugal. Um, so um, I'm Portuguese, by the way. Uh, and the, the thing is, you can calculate the mass of this object either from uh, um, the, uh, you know, with spin. So if you assume uh, like you can have any spin parameter, then you get this blue curve. So you can go to masses that are above 3.75 solar masses. But if, if the two objects are, if the spin is not well constrained, then you have that orange bar. So clearly, for GW190425, there has been a lot of speculation about the nature of this system. If it's a new the neutron star, it's much heavier than the ones we see in the galaxy. Is the companion a black hole and so on? So there, there has been a lot of discussion on that. But now, of course, our system is, is basically here. And that's more or less the uncertainty in, in the measurement. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's clearly uh, it's different from the other systems you see in our galaxy. Regarding timing, so just, we are we are a little over time. Just want to let you know. Uh, okay, okay. So I'll, I'll move quickly. So regarding timing, um, so the GBT earlier observations of this system uh, proved to be very uh, useful for constraining the these things. So we have some our data from two thousand four, and this allows us to put already some constraints on the some of the relativistic parameters. Uh, so from the lack of Shapiro delay, we can conclude the mass of the companion is above two solar masses. From the lack of uh, the uh, gamma parameter, uh, it's uh, from the non-detection of the gamma parameter can include very large companion masses above 2.9 solar masses. Anyway, uh, just going through it, so the com this companion is um, the mass range there is in red. It's kind of in this mass gap between black holes and neutron stars. Um, what, but it's still it's still relatively wide, but it's going to be whatever it is. It's it's going to be interesting uh, to be interesting. How it formed? I have the, this animation for you. I think this is this is quite an interesting thing. So this illustrates the formation process that we we think might happen. So we have here a, a white dwarf with a pulsar, and uh, then the black hole comes, and uh, and then you have a bit of a chaotic phase uh, in the evolution of the system. And uh, what tends to happen in these cases is from laws of thermodynamics, heat flows from hot to cold, means that the objects with larger kinetic energy um, transmit it to the objects with lower kinetic energy. And if something has a lower mass, well, then it means the same kinetic energy means higher velocity, so it gets ejected. So that low mass white dwarf got ejected, and now you have a, um, um, a pulsar with a, a, a massive companion, which could be a black hole. The interesting thing is that, uh, and I'm almost finishing, is that um, so we had a neutron star. There's a first exchange encounter that recycled this pulsar. And then um, there was an ex a second exchange encounter that placed its companion. That we were just on an animation of that. Uh, so they replaced its previous companion with the current one. But 
we speculate that if the companion mass is around 2.5 solar masses, then it could have itself have formed in a neutron star neutron star mer merger. Because that's we don't know um, of any other black holes formed in our galaxy with this kind of mass. But we know that uh, neutron star neutron star mergers exist in the universe, and we know that they would form objects with this mass, whether they're stable neutron stars or black holes, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, what matters is the mass. So we know that we can form objects via this channel, that this system could be the result of, uh, of these kind of systems. So my last two slides, so continued timing. So we'll be able to measure the great improvement measurement of the Einstein delay. And uh, uh, we'll continue to improve, improving the sensitivity for uh, pulsations from the companion, which we looked for, but we'll we want to keep looking more sensitively. Um, and if the companion is a black hole, then it's uh, very exciting because um, if it formed in a neutron star neutron star merger, uh, it will be well not not only because it's the first millisecond pulsar black hole system ever discovered, which has been kind of a holy grail in our field, but uh, also it's what I find is particularly exciting is that uh, for this particular mass is that. If it is indeed formed in a double neutron star merger, then it will be sp spinning very fast. And this will have a spin parameter close to one. In this case, the lens tearing, uh, the, the frame dragging caused by this black hole would induce a precession in the plane of the orbit from this uh, lens tearing effect. And uh, this could potentially be detectable in the timing of the pulsar. Uh, what this amounts to is actually, uh, we can actually do in this case, a test of the cosmic censorship hypothesis. Um, uh, so, um, if you have a spin parameter that's larger than one, then you have a naked singularity. So, this is a, a su super exciting prospect, in my opinion. Um, if not, if it's a high mass neutron star, it's still valuable because, of course, so in the past we've had high mass neutron stars. Uh, and uh, if we found one with a mass that's significantly larger than the ones that have been measured already, then we exclude even more equations of state. For dense matter, and that is, of course, uh, um, also a very interesting out outcome. So, yeah. So that is my last slide. Uh, just want to thank you, everyone, for the for the invitation and for the opportunity to be uh, to be here. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Paula. That was a really fascinating talk. It's a great paper. Um, we are a bit over time, um, but I will uh, relay one uh, question, maybe two, if we can get through it quickly. Um, the first one, what uncertainties are there on the timing from the cluster potential? Uh, yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, so the cluster potential affects things like um, the uh, orbital period derivative and the um, also the, the spin frequency derivative of the pulsar. So they, they, those are affected by that acceleration. But apart from that, the uh, this will have no effect whatsoever on the um, advanced periosteum, or or the the other quantities like uh, like the position. So the we calculated in detail on the the correlation matrix, and there's no effect. So okay, we'll get uh, one more question in here. In the optical image of the globular cluster, there were two sources highlighted by color circles. Uh, what types of objects are those, if you know? Um, and just to confirm that the MSP is where the cross was in that image. Yeah, uh, that's right. So the, the MSP is the is the cross in that image and the, and the, the two objects. So um, as you see, there's a large density of stars. Um, the, the, red, um, the red one is a 0 0.7 solar mass main sequence star. And we discussed this in the paper. You can see it in the materials and methods. And that blue one is a 1.2 solar mass um, blue straggler. Yeah. So it's, but it's not associated because if if it were 1.4 solar masses, it would have to be significantly brighter. And of course, there's a large positional offset. Okay, I think that's all the time that we're going to have for questions today. Um, but if there are additional questions, I saw that you put your contact information on the last slide, so I would encourage um, people to, to reach out via email. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending, and we will have another community Zoom in two weeks. We hope that you join us for that. Have a good day. Bye.